Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's study. We're going to uh, pick up where we left off with First uh, Samuel chapter 3. And uh, before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. The dear Father in heaven, we are grateful that we can be here each morning and to receive light and to receive strength and power and peace and grace, and to receive the blessings that you have prepared for us. We pray for one another. You know, Lord, that there's always trials around us, and that you have allowed these for our good, that we can call upon you. We pray that uh, as we look at 1 Samuel chapter 3, uh, that we come to understand uh, its message for us today, and that you can correct any error in our understanding. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so, yeah, I've looked over chapter three, uh, which is really quite interesting. Now, one of the things, um, I'm, I'm going to wait till when Kelly comes, if, if he shows up, I want to look at the quote that he had shared at the end of the study, but I'll wait till to show that when he gets here. So remind me, maybe it's a quote that's from life sketches, which we're all familiar with, but I wanted to look at it. Uh, but anyway, when I looked at chapter three, reading over it, it has some, some details that we, we sort of need to look at. So we had talked about how chapter two had this section from verse 12 to 21 that covered the first, second, third angel's messages. And that was, yeah, so there was uh, the section from 12 to, I'm trying to remember here, 12, I think it was 12 to 17, then 18 and 19, and then 20 and 21. And then we had some discussion whether, so those would be, represent the first, second, and third angel's messages. And then if we would apply the next part to like a repetition of the messages or something like that. Maybe it's the fourth angel's message. Now in first Samuel chapter three, it's going to have this story uh, dealing with the calling of Samuel. And the thing that's interesting is that this goes from verse one to verse 21. And, and that means it could represent 2001 to 2021. And so we would have to think about that, uh, whether that's the case or not. So it's one of those things we look at and we, we examine. And, of course, the really obvious thing is how many calls does Samuel have? So anybody know offhand? We're going to look at it. but we, we have the calls that were made to Samuel, but we also have the warnings that were given here to Eli. Yeah, there's warnings to Eli. But yeah, but in this in here, we're going to have the calls to Samuel and there's going to be three calls and then he's going to have a fourth. Correct. And in the fourth, he's going to be called Samuel, Samuel, which is the second angel's message. Right. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But but there's a bunch of symbolism here. So so we're going to go. We'll, we'll start again from the beginning where we had it started with verse one. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. So we connected this, this open vision with the fact that Ellen White had open visions, and her first open vision was in Portland. Maine. No, it wasn't Maine. We had a quote that was shared, and it was, was it New Hampshire? Or, yeah, so it's, yeah, Newport, It okay, so, yeah, so, okay, yeah, so Portland, Maine, I'm getting mixed up. So we got Portland, Maine, her first open vision, and her last open vision is Portland, Oregon, right? And right. then we have Newport, New Hampshire, and Newport, Washington? Correct. Okay, that, that are tied, and that's going to be tying that to the 2520. And we know that the word vision there is kazone. And so that has to do with the 2520. 
So these things from the past in our history in this movement, we think that this is referencing that. Now, so, you know, one of the things that we can see about this is that however we look at chapter three, whether we take, you know, the different verses relate to years, we can see that there is in 2001, if we took verse one as representing for 2001, I mean, there would be a connection. I'm not saying that each verse has to be exactly a year, but it definitely marks that period of time. Now, when we talk about the 2520, remember prior to 2001, we didn't have an understanding of the 2520. What's the connection between what happened at 9-11 and our understanding of the 2520? How are those two connected? Or are they connected? Well, we have the the understanding of the third woe beginning in 2001. And with this, with the, the seven times, we also need to come to an understanding of the blessings and the curses. And at this point, I think the two of them are linked in that way. Okay. Yeah, they, they are. But is there more to what nine, the understanding of 9-11 gave this movement. So there's a more direct path that that becomes clear. So let's look at it this way. The charts. What's on the charts in particular that connects us to 9-11? I mean, you sort of addressed it. Islam. We have, yeah, we have Islam on the charts, right? So what happened with 9-11 is it drew our attention more closely to the charts than before. Right. Right. And then it was an examination of these charts that led us to look at the 2520 on the chart. Now, the 2520 had been on the chart. Many Adventists knew about the charts. You knew about the charts. I didn't. You know, maybe, maybe, you know, I should have. <laughs> you know, maybe there was some opportunity to have known about them, but I didn't. My friend Peter Plum, he in 1989 he found out about the charts and the 2520 on the chart, and he began teaching people the 2520. He did sermons on it. He would talk to pastors about it. There was no, like, prejudice about it. Like, it was just a curiosity. Nobody was particularly interested in it. You know, Kelly Ross used to have, you know, Peter Plum present him studies on the 2520, and Kelly said he would go to sleep. And it's pretty hard to do with Peter Plum because he's a pretty high-energy guy, but... uh you know, so we had this this understanding of the charts, and that led to understanding of the 2520. And so we should always keep that in mind. Now, another connection had to do with, as, as we continue to study these things, uh, connecting what what's on the charts with 9-11, you know, there was, uh, you know, as we, as we further studied, we just we could see that the 2520 was inseparable from understanding any of the prophecies, including the prophecies connected with uh, Islam, right? That they were all part of a structure, which I'm not going to go into all the different parts, but, but they all fit together like a puzzle, right? It wasn't like all these different prophecies that Adventists had understood before we would see, okay, the 70 weeks are part of the 2300 days, but we didn't connect like the 1260 to the 2300 days in any sort of way, right? Like we didn't, we didn't see like, you know, from 34 AD to 538 as being, you know, 504 years and that that was, you know, two times 252 or even four times 126, right? There was no, no, like 34 AD to 1798 being seven times 252, right? We just didn't connect those things. Now, so what's a further connection, any other connections between uh, the understanding of Islam and the 2520? Any other things that I'm leaving out? So definitely looking at Islam led to looking at the charts that led to the 2520. And there are symbols that connect them. Anything else I'm missing? One of the points that I look at, I, and this may be off 
the exact question that you're asking. Mm -hmm. The way that this verse is written, <clears throat> we come to an understanding that when the church is pure, all of the gifts of the Spirit will be active. Now, in 2001, the gifts of the Spirit were not active. Yeah. Now, I have problems with the idea that the church is pure because... I mean, I don't really think the church is pure. Like, this movement isn't pure. We're not pure. So what do you mean by the church is pure? I think there's something more than just the church being pure. I don't think that that's particularly the point that I would bring up. But. I'm just going from the quote. Yes. So, okay, so here's here's a situation. The church at Samuel's time was disgusted because of the way that Eli's sons, so it's Eli mm -hmm. and his sons, had been addressing the worship at that point. And so the people were disgusted because they weren't really worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Now, our situation in 2001, for many of us, is the church, the structure, the corporate structure, and the leadership had chosen a path that was leading them to a closer and closer relationship with Rome. Yeah. And definitely with the world. And definitely with the world. Yeah, because it's, I mean, the Rome is just a result of that. That's more symptom of of the connection with the world first right if that makes sense okay it's not like they connect with rome and then thus connect with the world they connect with the world first World worldliness comes in first so in this way we have a we have an example here with eli where god could not communicate with the high priest and his sons their sins like a thick cloud had shut out the presence of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. they, they had not shut out the presence directly of Christ, but they had shut out the comforter. They had shut out the one that would convict them of sin. Yeah, and, 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 and that is prophecy was the thing that... Um... Like if we look at the Seventh-day Adventist Church and we look at 1989... And 9-11. So what we have is first we had a prophecy. We had a minister giving a message to the church about what was going to happen. Daniel 11 verse 40 B. And that, of course, was rejected. Church didn't want to hear anything about that message. And right. when it came to pass, there were some Seventh-day Adventists, such as myself, who knew about Lewis F. Weir's prediction and saw that as a fulfillment, right? Um, Jeff is one of them. Uh, he's going to see that happening, 1989, and, and he's going to also see the re repeat of Millerite history, that there's, that there's going to be a repeat of that, the first and second angel's messages. And that develops from 1989 when he first begins studying that. Now, we know that we can count from 1863, when the 1863 chart is made, there's uh, 1,260 years to 1989, and that symbol comes from the 2520, right? So, so part of it is that we come to this time of the end. There's a first angel's message. The church has this opportunity with the arrival of the first angel's message to receive a message and they reject it and then a second angel's message comes at 9 11 and they're going to reject that right so so when it says the word of the lord was precious in those days that means it's obviously uh not valued that's not what the word precious means it just means that it's very rare it's hard to find right correct so there was no open vision 
that's just adding to why it's precious. There's no open vision. And so the word of the Lord here is just messages from God is are rare at that time. But we're going to have this message coming to Eli, and that is it's going to be the first, second, and third angel's message. So that means the church, the leadership, has this message, but it doesn't come directly to Eli. It comes to Samuel, right? So Samuel represents the the church being passed by. Is it the church being passed by, or is it leadership being passed by? Well, when I say the church here, I mean the organized structure is passed by. All right. Now, first they're passed by in 1989, as far as light is concerned. So that would be the first angel's message. Right. So they're going to receive a message in there. But that message isn't going to come to the church leadership. And, and my argument is that prior to 1989, we had ministers who were receiving light and presenting. But in 1989, it's not going to be ministers or scholars. It's going to be Jeff, you know, just somebody who's who's nobody, just, uh, you know, uh, construction worker who's going to uh, receive this message. God's going to choose him as the instrument. And that would be represented by a message that Samuel represents a message, not particularly a person. He doesn't represent Jeff as a person, but as a message that comes. Right. And so that message comes to Samuel. In some ways, you could say Samuel just represents those that hear God, right, or that are an answer, you know, because God God has answered, God has heard. But it also can refer to those that hear God, right? So, so we have to look at Eli as representing the church. Now, we also have zoomed in and said that Eli can represent uh, this movement as well. And the message that comes to it. So we have that magnification where we can zoom in and zoom out. It's a fractal. So you're going to see the same thing on a smaller scale. But we, we tend here, I think, to look at this. At least I'm looking at this broadly first. Right. Rather than to zoom in to the particulars about our movement. I think that's the way that we, as we've gone through this, it seems to make the most sense to first do that. And then see how it applies. But we have we have applied it both ways. Okay. So then it came to pass when Eli was laid down in his place that as he's gone to sleep, his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. But in, air, in, what's in that the, in this situation? Yeah. When we're when we're considering this, we're also being told that the call of Samuel was a message of condemnation to Eli's house and was the beginning of the commission of Samuel as a prophet. Mm -hmm. So at this young age, Samuel is becoming a prophet so that the membership would begin to understand that there is truly a prophet in Israel. So here is Eli, and it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place that his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. So Eli, at this point, at his age, was blind. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was Laodicean. Yeah. Yeah. So, and... And then when we look, I just wanted to read the other verse. And, and ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. So one of the things we see is that Eli can't see, he's blind. But also the lamp of God went out in the temple. So what's the lamp of God? Isn't that the lamp that was to, to ever be burning in the holy place? Yeah, but as a symbol... It represents the word of God, right? Okay. So not only can Eli not see, not only is he's blind, but within the church, the word of God has gone out, right? But in, in the church, there still is the ark of God, which, which is God's presence. But the thing is, 
it can't be seen, right? We have the Ten Commandments, they're not being obeyed, right? Things are not. Now it says, yeah, so the lamp went out. And what does that word mean, ere the lamp went out? In the, um, does that mean the lamp was on still? Uh, that before or not yet? No, I'm. If I'm reading that, is it that the lamp had gone out, or is that before the lamp of God? Yeah, that's what I was wondering here. So, so it's. I, I think it's just before the lamp goes out is the idea. Now, the word uh, terem uh, means to interrupt or suspend. Properly, non-occurrence used adverbally as not yet or before. So, so it's it's just at the time that the lamp is going to go out, right? So he can't see the lamp is going to go out. So exactly when it goes out, I don't know, right? It doesn't it doesn't say. Okay, see, I'm I'm looking at Webster's right now, and it does say before. Yeah, the word air. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I was just looking at, at the Hebrew. So I guess it's before the lamp goes out then. So that means that light is still being given. How about that light is available? Okay, light's available. Maybe that's better. Okay. So so the leadership is blind, but the lamp of God has not gone out yet. And it, this is in the temple of, of the Lord where the ark of God was. Now, I remember... You know, is it my Bible friends where it has like, I think Samuel like sleeping in the temple or something like that, which I don't think he would have done. But uh, maybe that's just my impression from when I read it to the kids. So why would they mention about the lamp of God in the temple? I mean, nobody's should be in there, right? Isn't the admonition that the lamp is to be eternally burning? No, the lamp goes out at at night. It doesn't burn eternal, in, eternally, I don't think. Like they trim the lamp in in the morning and the evening, right? So in order to trim the lamp, you have to put it out. But we're talking about a seven-stick menorah. Yeah, I know. But still, they, they trim the lamp, right? And it's they're going to trim it. In the morning, it's not going to be like right at sunrise. I'm not sure exactly. And then they trim it. It's it's not right at sunset. It's before. So it's going to be burning longer at night. At, and I always assume it goes out at night. Um, and they light it again in the morning. But I could be wrong. I don't know if anybody has information on that. So this is before the lamp of God went out in the te- in the temple. So that would assume that it does go out. And I don't, you know, so whether it's supposed to or not, that's what it says here in this verse. Um, okay. What was the what was the passage you wanted to read when Kelly got here? Okay. Yeah. So that passage, uh, I'm going to have to. Yeah. yeah. So it says, if they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus, who was just before them, leading them to the city. They were safe, but some grew weary and the city was a great way off and they expected to have entered it before. Then Jesus would encourage them by raising his glorious right arm. And from his arm came a light which waved over the Advent band and they shouted hallelujah. Others rashly denied the light behind them and said that it was not God that had led them out so far. The light behind them went out, leaving their feet in perfect darkness. And they stumbled and lost sight of the mark and of Jesus and fell off the path down into the dark and wicked world below. So to me, that applies to this this situation. So so we know that the light, you know, the light that comes is is the light from Millerite history. OK, so Kelly, the comment. But it happened at that time as Eli was lying down in his place. Now his eyesight had begun to be poor. He could not see well. And the lamp of God had not gone out, had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord of the earth. 
if God was, that's the New American Standard Bible. So it just says the same thing, but just maybe clearly that it's it not had not yet gone out. I don't really like that translation, but because it's not literal enough for me. So if we're going to apply this to this this the lamp of God in the temple, that there does come a time when the lamp goes out. Is that what we would understand? Yeah. Now, I appreciate the fact that Kelly would share this from the NIV and the NASB. If we did look at Young's literal. Oh, and the NIV is there too. I didn't see that. Yeah. If we looked at Young's literal or Webster's, but Young's literal more specifically would say, and the lamp of God is not yet extinguished. Yeah, which means it's put out if you use that. Like, not just gone out, but extinguished means put out. Okay. That mean? I mean, that's the way I take the word extinguished. Okay, but I'm I'm comparing that with Leviticus 24.2. Okay. Because 24.1 and... Okay, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil, olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually. Right, and continually doesn't mean continually. It's to burn tamid. Right, which which does not necessarily mean continually. Right, so... It doesn't mean that, because that word does not mean that it never goes out. It just, it, it's, it's the word it could mean daily, right? That is, there's, does that make sense? Because there's lots of things that are told to be done, uh, to meet that obviously are not done without interruption. Well, the way that the way that we have approached this in the past, mm-hmm. when we have run into this with Tamid, we've always looked at that as an ongoing basis. In a daily basis. Okay. But, not, but does not mean right. So we've never taken the word to mean uninterrupted in the sense of like uninterrupted on a daily basis, that is every day, but not um doesn't mean that it's you know, that they don't put the lamps out is all I'm trying to say, right? So, I mean, if you look up the word to me, uh, I got to go here. So it could mean continuity, perpet- perpetuity, perpetuity, uh, to stretch continually, continuously, continuity, right? That's what the word means, but it doesn't necessarily mean what, because there's different words of continuity. Right. We, even in English. OK, but when I like I, I continually go to the gym every day, but I'm not there 24 hours a day. When when we consider this mm-hmm. in 24, two. And then we add to it 24, three and 24, four. Yeah. I think the admonition is is specific in what you're trying to represent. So 24.3, without the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation, shall Aaron order it from the evening unto the morning before the Lord continually. It shall be a statute forever in your generations he shall order the lamps upon the pure candlestick before the lord continually right so that means every day they light the lamps okay right evening and morning specifically right because that word order means to to set in a row or arrange put in order prepare so so they're going to do this every day. So there's not a day that they can just let the lamps burn out and not relight. Right. Okay. But the lamps do go out. Do, do we agree with that or not? I'm considering that point. Okay. I mean, as we are well aware, when it came to Hanukkah, 
it was a shock to the children of Israel in their tradition that the lamps would burn continually or would be burning for eight days. So here we have the lamps burning. Now, the question, and I, I have to go back to a presentation that Jeff had given several years ago. He yeah. always he always seemed to be presenting that the lamps were being lit not during the day, but during the night. Based on? I'm just going according to what he had presented. Yeah. That I recall. Now, I, I could hear again be wrong. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I don't know of anything in the Bible that says that they're lit in the night. The morning and evening, the lamps are trimmed. But here it says that the lamp, before the lamps go out. So I would assume that if the lamps go out at some point in the night, they have to be trimmed in the morning. Unless we have, you know, some statement that says differently. All I know is that the word continually does not mean anything different than what it means in in in, in English. It, it, it can mean something that has no interruption, but generally it just means on a daily basis. Like we're into perpetuity, right? So it's something that's that's occurring all the time. You're not you're not gonna have a day where the, the lamps don't burn. Okay, so so Kelly has one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So regularly. Yeah. Usually the better way to translate is just daily. So anyway, now why, that, the, that's why, the, why the quotes from Proverbs? Yeah, I'll read them to you. Proverbs twenty twenty seven says, The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the valley. And the other one was what? 20, 27 something? 24, 20. 24. It was 2420 and 2027. So I think you read, I'm not sure which one you read first. Okay. 2420 says, there shall be no reward to the evil man. The candle of the wicked shall be put up. And apparently that's, the candle is the lamp. So I was just drawing a, drawing a comparison. Mm -hmm. I think it's talking on, in a symbolic sense about our need to be renewed day by day. So basically, if, if we're looking at this with Samuel, 1 Samuel 3, verse 3, and before the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, here am I. So would that, would that be a, a proper way of looking at this? Okay, what, what are you saying? What's... Okay, we were addressing the word air. Yeah, before. So before the lamp went out in the temple of the Lord. Okay. Yeah. Now, you're, the, the point that we addressed at the beginning of the meeting, the lamps represent the word of God. Yeah. So before the word of God was extinguished in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and before Samuel was laid down to sleep, the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, here am I. Yeah. It, no, not before he was laid down to sleep. He was already laid down. But you can do that in English, but you can't do it in Hebrew. Okay. Does that make sense? This is why we're here to talk about this. This is why yeah. we're here to learn. Yeah, so Samuel's laid down to sleep. So before the lamp of God went out, where the ark was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. And and the reason why, uh, just to kind of explain the grammar in Hebrew, so i got to get to there, and just looking it over carefully. So the Hebrew is actually quite a bit different here. I'm trying to figure this out. Okay, yeah, okay, there it is. So before the word Samuel, it just took me a while because some of the word order is different to look at this. Um, there's what we call the consecutive vav. That's translated as an, and, right? And Samuel was laid down to sleep. That would separate that clause. So you couldn't have any of the actions or whatever connected to the next part of the sentence. 
like we could in English. Does that make sense? So when okay, you have so that and and it's represented by a vav, the letter vav, you can't you can't like connect like before the lamp of God went out and before Samuel was laid down to sleep. If you want to have it before Samuel was laid down to sleep, you'd have to have that word air and air Samuel was laid down to sleep because of the vav in the sentence. That makes sense? Well, okay. To consider it, like you said, you can do this in English. You cannot do it in Hebrew. Right. Yeah, it's just a different sort of syntax that they have. So they, they have different rules. Right. So in English, we have lots of leeway on how we put together sentences, which can add to humor, right? Um, you know, things that there's you, you can read something in English and you can get a different sense out of it. It can be funny sometimes. But... Uh, in Hebrew, it's 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 simpler sort of grammar. So anyway, Samuel's laid down to sleep. Now it doesn't to he's laid down to sleep. Obviously, to sleep is is added, right? So it doesn't mean he was asleep, but he went he laid down. And the purpose of laying down here is to go to sleep. Okay. Now I'm trying to I'm looking at this sentence. It's it's kind of weird. So. They're going to put, and Samuel was laid down. They're going to actually put, like, where the ark of God was is is in the next part of the sentence. And I'm trying to figure out why. So it says, and Samuel laid down in the temple of the Lord where there was the ark of Elohim. Now I don't I don't think he would be lying in the most holy place. No. But it does seem like he's lying in the holy place. So I don't quite understand this why the sentence is in this order and they don't translate it in that order in the King James. Right? The young says and Samuel is lying down in the temple of Jehovah where the ark of God is and that's what it says in Hebrew. So if he's lying down in the temple he's at least in the holy place. Correct. So that 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 seems odd to me. I mean, that's what my Bible friends does, but I I always just thought that was you know they're doing a book for kids and they don't. So that's kind of odd. Huh. So what do people think of that? That do we have any Ellen White quotes on that? I've looked at at a lot of this and I didn't see anything specific for this. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just looking at different people's opinions here. If anybody has something that they can give us a scripture, people have lots of different opinions, but they can't really prove them about different things here on these verses. Okay, well, we're going to have to leave that until, because I, I can't solve it. I don't have any way. So, so, you know, some commentators say, well, it's not in the holy place. It's just, you know, but at this time, we know they just have the tabernacle, right? So there isn't a... a a temple with, you know, all the different rooms and everything, right? We just basically have the tabernacle. Would that be how we would see this at this time? But even with the tabernacle, you're going to have the holy and the and the holy of holies. Yeah, I'm, yeah, but I'm saying there's no like other rooms. No, just like, like the temple. The temple has other rooms. You know, you could say he's in the temple sleeping but he wouldn't necessarily be in the holy place but it it seems to hear to me here that he's in the holy place even though some commentators say he's not <laughs> um but they don't show it in any way they don't like prove that he's not uh, so i'm not quite sure why they say he's not because it seems to be from the hebrew that he is in the holy place not in the most holy because you could say, you know, the Ark of God is in the temple. He's he's in the holy place. He's still where the Ark of God was, he, right? What lamp in there? Yeah, he's got he's in the place where the lamp is, but not yeah. where the ark is. But the whole temple has the lamp and the ark. He's not in the most holy place though. But he would be in the holy place. That's that's what I would gather from this. 
So, so what does that mean symbolically? I know we're, we're picking through this pretty slowly, but if we, we have the lamp of God representing the word of God, a message, light to God's church. Okay, so there's a spirit of prophecy quote that Kelly has up there. Okay. Um, the word of the Lord was precious in those days. Days There was no open vision, and it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, his eyes began to wax dim, but he could not see. So we read all of that. Supposing the voice to be that of Eli, the child hastened to his bedside of the priest, saying, Here am I, for thou callest me. The answer was, I called not my son, lie down again. And thrice he responded in like manner. And then Eli was convinced that the mysterious call was the voice of God. And the Lord passed by his chosen servant, the man of hoary hairs, to commune with the child. This in itself was a bitter yet deserved rebuke to Eli and his house. Which, yeah. So we understand that Eli being passed by represents the church organizational structure being passed by. There's other quotes Kelly shared. But like some of these quotes we're going to end up reading. They're in our document. So the thing is in the Hebrew, it says Samuel was laid down to sleep in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, right? So that's the order it puts in Hebrew. But most of the translations do what the King James does is it's, it puts, and Samuel was laid down to sleep at the end, but that's actually ere the lamp went out and Samuel was laid down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. All right. So what, what some people do with this is they take this, this verse, different commentators, and they just say, Oh, it's before the morning. It's before dawn. So they're just using this expression, you know, before the lamp went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark was, Samuel was laid down to sleep, right? So they take it like the King James has it here. And then they say, this is just, this just means before dawn, before they have trimmed the lamps. But it, to me, it seems clear from the Hebrew that Samuel is laid down and it says, in, it has the bet prefix before the word temple, in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And, and because we have the consecutive Bob and Samuel was laid down to sleep in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, that that means that that's where he was laid down to sleep, not as the translators translate. Okay, so then Samuel's called. So this is going to be the first call in his in his place. What, what are you asking about in his place, Kelly? Eli was lying down in his place. Is that what you're asking about? Okay. So it's just where he lies down is his normal place to lie down. So it doesn't say where that is. We don't know where his place is. It's just in his spot where he sleeps, wherever that is. But Samuel's going to be in the temple of the Lord, according to the Hebrew. So he gets the first call. So what does it mean he runs to Eli, thinking that it's Eli that called him? Is he running like those that would have the tables described in Habakkuk? Mm, no, I'm not sure. How would that how would that apply? Well, he's given a call. He wants to know the reason for the call. He assumes that it is Eli because at this point he does not know the voice of God. He does not know the voice of Jehovah. Yeah. Okay. But how would you connect that to that him that run that run that readeth it? Reading and hearing. Aren't they supposed to give the same reaction? I don't. I don't sure what you mean. Because he, I mean, it's quite a bit different idea. Because the run in Habakkuk is 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 a proclamation of a message, right? This is a person who is like a post, but that's not that's not the word in. Well, let me see. It is actually the same word. Okay. So it is the same word, but it seems to me a different context. 
I don't know. I wouldn't connect him running to Eli with the Habakkuk's tables. But you're saying it's like the first angel's message, right? I that's you're trying to connect it. That's that's a way of doing it. Yes. Okay. Well. So okay. So the, maybe I'm understanding now what you're saying. So you're saying that he ran to Eli. That's to the leadership, giving this first angel's message. Correct. Okay. Okay. Now now I see what you're saying. Okay. So it is a proclamation of a message. Right? That's what you're Correct. saying? Right. Okay. 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 I see now. Okay. That makes sense now. So he, he runs to Eli. So in 1989, when we get the first angel's message in our history, do we run to Eli? I think that there are those that did. Yeah. Well, even Jeff would have. I mean, he's a Seventh-day Adventist going to a regular Seventh-day Adventist church, right? Didn't he say he sent out tapes from FFA, I guess before it was called FFA, to every minister of the SDAC? Yeah, I'm not sure when he did that. But, yeah, he did give the message to to Adventist ministers, yeah. right? I mean, he had, a his, clear. We had a lot of people warning him. That you know about the fall of the Soviet Union, et cetera, and to be be prepared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so Jeff was giving that message, that first angel's message. Now he was mostly just doing it himself. I mean, obviously he joined you know Hope International in the nineties, and uh, um, you know had. Uh, those articles in um, the time of the end that ended up being in the time of the end magazine, right. Published in 1996 from January to November. So, so he's giving a message to the leadership and also to seventh day Adventists. So he's not, he doesn't have his own like, like offshoot sort of thing at that point, right. He just has a ministry. He's just sharing information. Yeah. Okay. So, so we can say that when Samuel goes to Eli, that is, in a sense, a proclamation of the message to the leadership of the church. So we're going to have, of course, in verse six, and the Lord called again Samuel. Right. So in these in these instances, he's just going to say the name Samuel. He doesn't he doesn't say Samuel? Samuel he just says Samuel. And he answered, "Am I?" And he ran unto Eli and said, "Here I'm at. For thou calledest me." And he said, "I called not. Lie down again." And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, right? So you got the first time, now the second time, Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli, and he said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. Or thus did Samuel, before he knew the Lord, and before the word of the Lord was revealed unto him, is an alternate translation. Um, but the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And then we're going to have a bunch of reading here to do. Okay, so let's just address these verses here. So there's three calls. Each time it just says Lord called Samuel. Right? It doesn't say like later in the, the fourth time it's going to be Samuel, Samuel. Okay. Any thoughts on this? Now, the thing that we're going to have is that Samuel, when, when he's called the third time and he goes, Eli is going to respond and say, you know, he perceived it was the Lord. How would we apply that then? Is the church going to perceive that it was the Lord that called him? Is that referring to when the third angel's message is proclaimed by the movement? How do we look at that? That's what it sounds like like to me. And I notice in one of those quotes from, from Patriarchs and Prophets, it ends with a bright and shining light. And I thought, Ellen, bright and shining light. That was quite, quite significant. Okay. Yeah, so... 
so exactly what that means i'm not i'm not certain how we would apply it specifically to the leadership of the church we do know that eli is not he's not going to really repent he's going to see his guilt but he's going to fail to renounce his sin is the quote that kelly has there the last one he posted Year after year, the Lord delayed his threatened judgments. Much might have been done in those years to redeem the failures of the past, but the aged priest took no effective measures to correct the evils that were polluting the sanctuary of the Lord and leading thousands in Israel to ruin. So, I mean, this is a problem we see in the church. I mean, there are many ministers who will see the problems, but do nothing about it. And, I mean, I'm not really an expert on what the I church is. I've heard that, that, ex that excuse. Oh, they say, well, they yeah, they say they, they'll meet. It's not just up to one man who leads, leads the church. It's up to the committee. It's up to this. It's up to this person. These people have to agree together. I mean, it's up to every one of us individually to to reform would be my reply. But anyway, I just listened to what yeah. they had to say. And but, yeah. So I know, like, because you got, like, Ted Wilson, and, you know, he speaks rather conservatively. I don't really know much about him. I mean, I know. I know more about his dad than I know about him, Neil C. Wilson, because I'm a bit more familiar with what was going on in the church back then than I am now, because I just don't really have any interest in it, to be honest, what the church is doing, what Ted Wilson's doing or not doing. But I do know that he he speaks as if, you know, he's concerned about things like spiritual formation and so forth. But nothing is really ever done. And I guess what Angela is saying is because, you know, you got all these committees. You have an institution that really doesn't allow for, you know, the conference president to have much power. Right. That is, he can't he can't. Party politics. Yeah. Well, there's politics. Yeah. And and, and I get that. from. You can't have one man having power. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you see the problem, you know, like pastors who, you know, they're not really going to speak up because their jobs are on the line. Right. So they try to do the work that they can do in their local congregation. But really, they're quite ineffective. Right. That is. It ends up being more a babysitting job than anything. And so. Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, that's what pastors have told me. <laughs> right. They're basically babysitting. Yeah, a friend of ours was fired for speaking up. And, um, and well, I know one pastor who began to speak up, well, he was more an administrator, um, but that ended his career as well, and also his health and uh, his life. So, so yeah, it, it can be really, really difficult unless – you know, you have a revival in the church and in the leadership, but that's not what you have. So it's so what we see is that Eli is resistant. The leadership is resistant, even in hearing the message. And even maybe in acknowledging that the message has truth to it, it's still going to be unchanged. Right. So the church isn't doing anything about the problems that exist. No, I mean, I'm not really sure if, if, if I was like the general conference president, I would be able to do anything, right? I'm not sure, right? How that, how that works, how much. I mean, I've been an elder in a church. You really can't do much about people. They're going to do what they do, right? You can. And, and if you do speak up, you know, there's always these voices that are going to spread rumors and gossip and anything they can do to weaken your influence that you might have through the things that you say and even through your own life, right? So um, so it becomes really difficult. Um, I don't, but, but this is the situation that, that we have, and this, this situation here with Eli, it's because it's a, we'll use the systemic problem. That is, it's something that's gone on so long and been unaddressed that th there is no power to control this, right? You, you just, what do you do? If you were going to clean up the church, it, it, would be, it would be devastating to the institutions of the church, right? You really couldn't do it. 
at this point, right? Without a message of revival that would work on the individual. We have to be moved on from on high, you know, like I remember one time. Yeah, sorry, I was sitting 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 in, in, in Sabbath school, we were talking about the sin problem, and I said, if we could just see how every sin that we do is crucify re crucifying Christ, would we be so eager to sin? Yeah, well, but the thing is, for many people, they don't they don't perceive their sin, right? They don't they don't know what's going on. Like they they often believe that their actions are are Christ like, you know. And and it's it's a difficult thing, you know. I mean, I see people on on both extremes. I see people who are very judgmental and critical, and and yet don't see anything about themselves at all. And then you have other people who can be um, very permissive, um, all in the name of keeping peace and ministering to those around them. And, and that's not something that, 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 that's easy. You know, there's that gray area in between that's very, very difficult to navigate. You know, the main thing that I find is that you have to speak the truth always. Doesn't mean you exercise power or control. But you speak the truth always, and you obey the truth always, right? So in your own life, if you don't represent God, it doesn't really matter what you say or do. Now, of course, That's people right. have different ideas okay. what it means to represent God, right? So some people will what does this allow sin say? to go on. What's that, Angela? I said, what does his word say? Like people need to be so much in tune with God and studying his word that they'll be guided by it daily. Yeah. You know, because we can't just compare ourselves with somebody else. Like it, this is what I face all the time. And it's so, it's so frustrating for me. Why don't you just be led by the word of God? by the spirit of God, because the natural carnal mind is enmity again. I mean, I know, understand all this, but it's so frustrating to be among people who have had the word, have had the instruction, and yet continually do whatever their flesh dictates. So, mm. well, I mean, you definitely can't uh, preach, preach, to people that's not the foolishness of preaching it doesn't work I mean, yeah i know i've done all that i've offered all the counsel i could and i just see that it wasn't received so so the lord just said to me what is that to thee follow thou me like just let them do what they're going to do and you just do what you need to do for your salvation and your own sanity so that's what i've chosen to do mm -hmm. okay so so we have these messages to the church we're saying that the church will hear these messages and even perceive that these messages come from God. But they're going to be unchanged by the messages. That is the leadership. OK, so therefore, Eli said unto Samuel, go lie down. And it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. So. So now here we're going to actually have in his place for Samuel as well in the, and that's Macomb. So he's going to now lie down in his place. So what do we make of that? Because um, Kelly had asked about it before, but now before it talked about Eli down, lying down in his place, the previous times it said that, or the first time anyway, he, uh, Samuel lay down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. But this time he's going to also lie down in his place. So do we take any significance of in his place here? It reminds me of in his lot, in thy lot. So each fulfills a, a role, right? Or fails to fulfill the role that God has designed for that person to fulfill. And then I'm thinking of the lines too, in his place, you know, the, the way marks. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, quite a different word than lot. Uh, so the word in his place. So let's let's take a look at this word, Macomb, um, how it's used. So it's 
it's used first time in Genesis 1 verse 9. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place. Right. So that's going to be the first time it's used. So one spot. Right. The idea is it's just one spot um, can be translated as home and room. Um, so you know, it's possible we could just use it in that sense. Seeing if there's any other. No, it does come from the word "com," which is used in reference to the sanctuary, the place of the sanctuary. But I don't, I don't think it's something that can be very specific. But anyway, we have it here. He lays down in his place this time. So, any ideas about? the significance of it. It's almost like Eli had an accepted place and Samuel had his accepted place as well. Yeah, well, I don't know. It, to me, it's just a spot. He's laying down in his spot that he needs to lie down in, whatever that spot is. I don't, I don't know about accepted. I think it, it's such a general word. Okay. But but what I would say is, why is it in this time he he now is they're they're using the word place where they didn't use it for Samuel previously. They just had him lying down in the temple of the Lord, and then he just lay down again. But now he's going to lie down in his place. So is that in a sense that not that he's going to lie down in Eli's place? But is it some way indicating that there is he's being replaced, that he now has a place, just symbolically, not literally? That could work. Okay. Yeah, there's so many interesting things here. What about Isaiah 56.10? His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They're all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down loving to slumber yeah well i thought of that one um, okay <laughs> so did i, I wanted to know the, what's it, wrong but they, they yeah, don't speak with, out against it the coward yeah. is an avarice so samuel you know samuel of course is not a sleeping dog right but no with eli, i wasn't referring yeah, to yeah. samuel yeah so eli <laughs> he went and laid down let me see where is it here Eli where is it where it says yeah he went he was laid down now it says to sleep but the to sleep is added and well that's Samuel again where we got to get Eli it's earlier yeah so he was laid down in his place so it doesn't say that he was asleep but some people say that you know his eyes began to wax dim could refer to him being drowsy but I think it has to do with the fact that he's blind. So I wouldn't really apply that to like his eyelids are heavy or anything like that. So he's lie, lie down uh, to go to sleep. And so does Samuel. The question is, is Eli asleep when Samuel goes to him? I would think that Samuel or, or that Eli is asleep, but it doesn't explicitly tell you that. Okay. <clears throat> It's kind of interesting going through this in such a slow manner. Every time we, we go over it, we see more things. It's always, I always find that interesting. So the, the question would be, so when we get to this tomorrow, then we're going to have the fourth time. So the fourth time, the Lord's going to say, Samuel, Samuel. And, you know, one thing we haven't done with this is we haven't, we haven't applied this to Millerite history. We've applied it to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But, of course, Millerite history is the template of the first, second, and third angels' messages. But I'm not really sure how we would apply that to Millerite history as directly as an application. I mean, we could, and we say the fourth is our history. But the way that I would look at it is I would say that this applies to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, in these three angels' messages as brought out. But then when we look at this movement, specifically Samuel, that this movement is about the second angel's message 
Even though it has the first, it's primarily about the second angel's message. Would we agree with that? The second angel's message that joins the third. Obviously, you need the first message has to precede the second. But the whole idea of, of Revelation 18 is that the second angel joins the third angel and it swells into a loud cry. It's just that you can't have the second without the first. Would, would we agree with that idea? Yes. Yeah. So, so we can see then that this, that, that this is repeating. It's a repeat and enlarge. So the first three messages is just like a summary of our history, that our history is this, this period of these three angels' messages being repeated from Millerite history, but it just shows these messages. But then the message of Samuel is is zooming in specifically to 9-11, the arrival of the second angel, when we apply it to the, this history. So that second angel's message is, is still the second angel's message. I know often we call it the fourth angel, but it's not really the fourth angel. I've, I've had this discussion with some people who try to argue it's, it's a completely different angel. It just gives the same message as the second angel. But... These angels are messages, right? Correct. If it's the same message, it's technically the same angel, even though it has some additions to it. Right. So it's not literally an angel that gives these messages. So the second angel's message is a repetition, is repeated in the in Revelation 18. It's that same message. And it's preceded by a first angel that has been repeated as well. That's the basis of this movement. So anyway, we'll come back to this tomorrow and people can give it some more thought. Kelly's posted some more things dealing with the lamps. I think that's Kelly, probably. Okay, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Not right now for me. Okay. Yeah, quote there about being blindfolded and deceived like Eli, deluded, uh, a parent who won't reprove their child. Yeah, I, I'm going to read this quote. So the child of truth will not have one appearance in your presence and when out of your sight do and say things she would not have you know. When before you, uh, she, your daughter, will utter smooth things as though her heart was filled with truth when she has no love for the truth. You are and have been asleep. You are just as much deluded as Eli was. And this is why I write to you so plainly. For unless I do, you will go on as indifferent, as blindfolded and deceived as you have been in the past. So that would be a pretty difficult thing to hear. But, it, you know, it can apply to some parents, obviously today especially. But definitely to, to the church. Okay. Oh, man, so, I see it every day in this house. It drives me wild. Yeah. Okay, well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you again for your goodness and love. And um, we just pray for your presence throughout this day. We pray for one another, for those searching for truth. We ask for your angels' care for our loved ones. And um, give us uh, faith and strength for today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.